Good evening. Welcome back to Computer Science 4300. Today, uh, we had a midterm break, so no lecture um, on Tuesday. But today, we are going over actions, replays, and uh, a little bit of architecture. So let me, uh, let me change this a little bit. Let's go over a little bit more A3 architecture. We're not really talking about components today. So we're going over actions and uh, we're not, I'm not going to tell you how we could do something like replays for our game. But uh, after this lecture, you'll pretty much see how you could do it if you wanted to do it and how easy that would be given the architecture that today's lecture is going to introduce. Um, this should be a pretty quick one. So I'm going to give some slides and then I'm going to dive into some code and show you a sneak preview of assignment three and sort of the action architecture for that we're going to use for assignment three. All right, so let's get going with the slides here. And hopefully this is a little bit informative. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so computer science uh, 4300 lecture number 10. We are going over uh, game actions and we're not explicitly going over a replay system, but I will show you how you could implement one if you wanted to. So game actions, what are game actions? Game actions are inputs that are given by the player of the game to be carried out by the game engine in some way. Um, actions could also be called commands, right? So some examples of actions or commands that you as the player of a game want to input into a game or a command that you want to give to the game or something like jump, walk right, shoot a bullet. Um, maybe also it's like move the menu cursor or select the text or move the pointer or aim here, right? So you are giving an action to a game that has some intuitive meaning. So game action inputs often come in the form of events. And those events are things like key presses, mouse movements, controller buttons, etc. So really, you know, from the time of like the Atari all the way up to the time of now, um, any button press or any keyboard press, like if you use WAS and D, those WAS and Ds are really move forward, left, down and right, or backwards and right. Um, the A button, is jump, the B button is run, right? So when you're trying to give commands, like when you're trying to play a game, the actual button that you push or the input me method that you push is just sort of a, it's a physical requirement that, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a physical requirement because we don't have telepathy yet. The, the game can't read your brain yet, right? So if we had something hooked up to our brain, you would just think jump and the player would jump. You would think walk to the right and the player would walk to the right. However, right now in this stage of the universe, you actually have to press a key or a button or a directional pad in order to give game actions. However, you know, ideally, we'd want to be able to decouple the action logic from the input logic, right? The act of jumping should not have anything to do with the act of pressing the A button, right? So the action of the game in terms of game logic of what has to happen when the player jumps or the player wants their character to jump should not be in any way, shape or form actually tied to what sort of input created that, right? So wherever we have our logic that says we want the player to jump or we want the player to shoot, ideally that, that part of the logic has no idea how the player inputted that command. So whether it was from a joystick or a mouse or a keyboard press or a Guitar Hero guitar or a, a microphone um, like I'm using here, the part of the code that where we want to say, okay, the player wants you to jump, do the jump. That should be completely separate from the physical manifestation of how the player actually wanted that to happen or, or caused that to happen. So how could we accomplish this? And a side benefit of this is that if we decouple the like physical manifestation of button pushing from the logic of performing actions, 
then we can do all sorts of cool things. Like we can remap keys. We could play multiplayer games, right? Because maybe the command is coming from a server. Maybe it's coming from another player. Maybe it's coming um, from a replay file, right? So we want the game logic to be separated from human inputs. So how are we going to do that in our game engine? So, so far in assignment one and assignment two, we've been performing actions directly inside the SFML event loop. So we say when a specific key is pressed, some sort of specific logic gets called, right? So if SFML key W, then move the player up or something like that. Something like that. In our current engine, we cannot separate the two. We cannot remap the keys. We can't do any of that cool stuff that we would want to be able to do if we, you know, were releasing an actual game that we would want to sell and we want to have users enjoy. So the assignment to architecture doesn't have anything in it to separate the actual pressing of keys from the actual inputs. So if we dive into our assignment to code here, we have something that looks like this. So inside our SFML event loop, we have something like if the event type is key pressed, then what we're going to do is we're going to basically do a bunch of if statements or, or a switch on, on the key code. So this literally says if the keyboard W key was pressed, then my character should be moving up. If the keyboard's A key was pressed, the character should be moving left right? If the P key was pressed, pause the game. However, this logic right here, ideally, this logic would have nothing to do with the actual input method. Maybe we would want the player to move up when we press the second mouse button or the middle mouse button. Maybe we want the player to move up when a certain um, packet is received from a network, right? But here in assignment two, we have hard coded it to say, not only is it a keyboard action, but specifically it's the W key, right? Now for simple games like Assignment 2, this is okay, but you would want this to be a little bit more abstract and a little bit more robust. And you'll see how simple this can be, how powerful it can be, and it ends up, in my opinion, actually being easier to put in new actions with the new system we're going to create than it is with something like this. So let's look forward. In assignment two, all of our input handling and systems logic was done in the game class since we only had one scene type, right? We only have that one scene that's actually playing the game. Moving forward, we're going to have a game engine class which can, which can manage any number of scene objects. So we looked at this already, but let's go back a little bit and, and let's look at this again. So here's the game engine class. The game engine class is going to store the top level game data. So it's going to store stuff like the assets, um, the window that SFML is drawing to, and the scene. So over here, for example, we're going to have a map of strings to scenes. So we can have like, here's the Mario scene, here's the Zelda scene, here's the menu scene, stuff like that. It's gonna have the window, that's an SF render window. It's gonna contain the assets, that's gonna be our images, our sounds, our fonts, stuff like that, our animations. Um, we're going to store which scene is currently running, etc. And this performs the top level functionality. So it's going to be doing the changing of scenes and it's also going to handle the input from the user. Okay, so um, the run function is going to contain the game main loop and the game engine pointer is going to be passed to the scenes in the constructor. And, and we'll get more into that specific stuff once we, uh, in the next class, when we do uh, the assignment three um, architecture overview. Now the scene base class is going to store stuff that's common to the scenes. So that's going to be things like entities, uh, maybe the frame count, and also the actions. Okay, so the actions now are going to be stored on a scene by scene basis. Because again, the actions that you perform maybe in the menu are going to be vastly different than the actions that you perform like in the Mario playing scene. So scene specific functionality is going to be carried out in the derived classes of scenes. 
The base scene is abstract. It cannot be instantiated. And um, we're going to have this simulate function that's going to call the update function, which is going to update our scenes. And then there's a scene derived classes. We're going to store scene specific data. Uh, for example, maybe the current level or the map that we're looking at, uh, the player, the configuration, etc. And scene specific systems are defined within the derived class. So maybe your collisions, um, your rendering, etc. Maybe they're in some scenes, not in other scenes. So some scenes derived classes may require different systems based on the functionality. But what we're going to do is we're going to require that three functions be implemented for each scene. And so that means each scene is going to have to implement their own version of these things. The update function, so the update function is basically like the tick, the game world tick that updates all the physics and stuff. The drawing, so whenever we want to, we can draw the scene. And the doing of the actions, so we're going to have a system which does actions. And these must be implemented for each scene. Excuse me one second. So what we're going to do now is we're going to show how we're going to transition from that hard coded W means up to a more uh, robust sort of action system. So let's try and implement a system where the scene only knows the type of action the player wants to perform and it doesn't care about the input method. So actions could come from anywhere. They could come from the keyboard, the mouse, a replay file, a network stream, a VR headset. It doesn't matter, okay? All the scene is ever going to know is the action that the user wants it to perform and not the input device that caused the action. So we're going to make an action class. So we're going to construct an action class which will store the type of action that the player wants the scene to perform. All user input is going to be handled within the game engine class where actions will be created and sent to the scenes to have their logic carried out. So the scene is going to then have a do action function which performs the logic based on an input action object. So what that means is the scene derived classes, the scene class will never know anything about the input method. It'll just get an action like jump or left or shoot. That's all the scene will ever know. It doesn't know if the W key was pressed or if the mouse was clicked, okay? So the actions are going to be given a name. So the name of the action will be just a string. And so we can construct an action that's like jump or the action will be left or the action will be shoot. Actions are going to be input via a keyboard or a controller or whatever, and they're going to have two phases. Actions are going to, like the keyboard or the mouse, essentially has two phases. So everything we do in a game basically is a button, right? So there's going to be a press and a release. And if we think about it, typically, um, let's say we're shooting, a, I don't know, an AK-47 in CSGO. Uh, pressing down means start the action of shooting and releasing the button means end the action of shooting. And so along with the name of the action, we're going to have an action type, which is start or end. Okay. So this is what the action class is going to look like. It's going to have inside as private var member variables. We're going to have two variables here. One is called name and one is called type. So name, again, is going to be something like shoot, jump, left, right, up, down, whatever. And then type is either going to be start or end. That's it. So um, our action class is going to have a default constructor, and it's also going to have a constructor where you can pass in a name and a type. Uh, of course, you have these getter functions, which allow you to get at the, uh, the name and the type internally. And then I have just this helper function down here, which is a, a two string, which lets you print out action things. So now that we have the action class, how are we going to implement the mapping of keys to actions? So we want to be able to specify which user input, for example, a keyboard key, maps to a specific action object. 
So this is actually really easy for us in SFML because in SFML, all of our keyboard keys have corresponding integer values. So we're going to use a map from integers to strings. That's it, that's how we're gonna do it. So an integer, the integer here is going to be the SFML key code for the corresponding keyboard key. And the string is going to be the name of the action that we want to be performed. So what's going to happen is that the scene base class is going to store a map from strings from ints to strings. Um, so this is going to be called the action map. So to register a key press to an action, we're going to have a function and that function is just called register action which is going to take in an integer, which is the input method or the key code, and the string, which is going to be the action name. And then all we have to do is insert that into the map. So action map input key equals action name. And then after that, each scene will now have its own map so we can have different actions that are available in each scene. So see how that works? We just look up whichever input key was pressed. We look up the action name in the game engine class and then send that into the scene. But how are we going to create the action objects? All right, now I know this is a lot of text on the slides, I apologize, but we're gonna jump into some code eventually to show this sort of in a lower, in, a, in, a, in an easier digestible format. So to create the action objects, the game engine class will handle the actual user input key presses and construct the action to send to the current scene. When a key is pressed, the game engine is going to ask the scene if it has an action name associated with that integer value. And if the scene has an action name associated, then we're going to create the object with the correct type, right? And so key press is gonna be start and key release is gonna be end. And that might seem a little bit complicated, but it's just three lines of code. Here are the three lines of code. So inside our game engine, remember the game engine is going to be the only class that knows anything about keyboard or mouse, okay? So in the game engine's user input function, it's going to uh, have one part here where it's like, okay, if the user pressed a key, so if the event type is key pressed, or the event type is key released. What this does is it detects that a, um, a key press or release has happened. So it says, if the current scene does not have an action associated with this key, then skip the, e excuse me, skip the event. So inside our scene, we're going to have that map from integers to strings, right? So what we can do is we can ask the current scene, hey, current scene, give me your action map, okay? And remember, that's int to strings. If we can't find the key code of that key press, so event.key.code is going to have the unique integer associated with the key press. Um, so essentially we're saying, hey, Mario scene, uh, the W key was pressed. Do you currently have anything associated with the W key? If you don't, so this right here just says if find equals end, that means it couldn't find anything in the map. So if it doesn't have a key associated with it, then just continue, right? Just, just go, go to the next action. We don't have anything we want to do here. However, if we do, then we want to first determine the action type, okay? So the action type, well, if the event type was key pressed, then it's going to be starting. And if it wasn't key pressed, then it was key released. And so it's gonna be ending. So here, this is the action type. Either if it was key pressed, it's the start of an action. If it was key released, it's the end of an action. And then what we do is we need to look up the name of that action, which was inside the uh, scene. So we ask the scene's action map, hey, give me, um, give me the name of the action that you have associated with this key press and I'm gonna create the action. So here, this is the creation of the action. Right here, this is the name of the action and this is the type 
of the action. Then um, we tell that scene to do that action. Okay, and that's that's how it works. That that's really as simple as it is. And I know that the first time you see this, this can be confusing. However, trust me, it will end up being uh, pretty simple in the end. Especially just just using it is going to be very simple. So now that we've constructed the action in the game engine, we send it to the scene to have its logic perform. And that logic is going to be done by the scene's derived class, do action. And that's going to take in a const reference to an action. We read the name and type of the action and then perform the logic of that action. And we never ever know what type of input created that action. Okay. Replays. How would we maybe how would we create a replay in a video game? Well, now that we have this action system, it's actually pretty easy. So many games have a functionality to be able to record gameplay in the form of replays. Now that our scenes don't know where an action came from, we can actually see how easy it would to to implement replay files. For example, all we would have to do is just store our action strings in a file associated with the specific game frame that they were performed on. And then all we would have to do is load that file in the game engine class and feed the actions to the scene. So now that I've said all that like word soup and it, you know, maybe it was a little bit confusing, I'm going to open up the assignment three code, which I will explain in its entirety in the next um, assignment, uh, in the next lecture. Um, but we'll look at how to do that. And this is just a, a final slide for the, um, the game engine architecture for uh, assignment three. So let's exit out of these slides here. We're going to discard those annotations and let's load up the assignment three architecture. So you can see here in assignment three, we've got a lot of, a lot of classes now. We're building a real game engine. It's pretty cool, right? So let me go over here to the game engine class. And we're gonna scroll down and we're gonna look at the user input function in the game engine class. So this is the game engine, this is the user input function. So all the different um, events are going to um, uh, look here, okay. So I've apparently got something in here which uh, saves screenshots. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> maybe I was testing something there, but uh, that exists. Let's ignore that for now and go down to actually what I wanted to look at. So here's the code, the literal code that we just saw in that slide. Okay. So as we iterate through all the events, um, we're going to ask the scene. And if we look over here at scene, it's going to have this action map variable. All right. So the scene has an action map, which is a map from integers to strings. The game engine is going to read key presses, ask the scene if it has those key presses registered, and if it does, it will send the correct action. So how 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 do we actually create those those actions? Well, it's really easy. So here in the initialization function of our um, scene, we're just going to call register action, and we're going to create a bunch of actions that we want to be able to happen. Okay, so for example here, when I press P, I want the game to pause. So I'm registering an action, which whenever I press keyboard P, I have this action type called pause. Okay, whenever I press the escape key, I want it to quit. Whenever I press the T key, I want to toggle the drawing of the textures. Now you might say, well, how, okay, I've created these strings, but what does that actually do? Well, now all I have to do is come down to the do action function, and then I just have a big if statement down here. And whatever strings I associated with actions up in the init function, now I have them down here, okay? So for example, um, if I want to toggle the textures, well, look at this. The scene has no idea whenever it's doing an action all, all it knows is I want to toggle a texture. I want to toggle a collision. I want to pause. I want to quit. And so no longer do you have to worry about any sort of input 
in your scene or the logic surrounding that input. Because all you're doing is reading the name of the action and then doing something based on the action. So uh, let's look at what happens with the assignment when you get it. So assignment three is going to come looking like this. And it has a menu, which is already done for you. And it's going to have this scene that just draws some stuff. I can't actually push anything right now. However, I can like draw some bounding boxes and stuff like that. Um, so actually, let's go look at the scene menu class. So in the menu class, I can press a few different buttons. All right. So I've associated the W key with up, the S key with down, the D key with play, and the escape key with quit. So if we come down here inside the do action uh, function of the menu scene, then you can see exactly what I'm doing here. Um, when I, whenever I want to quit, I just call the on end function. Whenever I want to play, well then I'm calling the change scene function to the, to the, to the play scene. And when I go up or down, I'm just changing the selected index of the, of the menu. So for example, uh, right now, I have index zero of this menu selected. If I press S, I increase that index. So then now these things are being selected, right? So I can have level one, level two, and level three. See how that works? So in my actual doing of those actions in the menu scene, all I know is that I want to move up. I want to move down. I want to play. I want to quit. It doesn't know anything about the keys at this point, And that's the important part here. So if we go back to our play scene, let's say we wanted to add uh, a button that prints out hello world to the console, okay? So how would we do that? Well, let's first go down to our do action function and let's just say um, else if uh, action.name equals console. So this is what I want to happen when this, this thing when this action called console uh, is is um, is activated. Oh my, I don't know why Visual Studio is being annoying. All right. So what do I want to happen when an action called console is started? Well, I want to say standard see out hello world. All right. So now the only other thing I have to do is register that action with a specific key press. Okay. So down here, um, or up here, sorry, I'm going to say, I'm going to copy this. I'm going to paste it. And I'm going to say, whenever I press the H key for hello world, I want this to call the console action. All right. So that's, that was it in 10 seconds. I created a new action um, in my game engine. So I'll come here. Now I can see, uh, let me actually, I don't want this to be full screened. Okay. So you can see the console back here. Now, if I press the H key here at the menu scene, nothing is happening. Okay. I don't know if you can hear that in the background. Nothing is happening when I press the H key because the H key is not registered to any action in the menu scene. These are the, this is the menu scene action here. Okay. So if I go over to the play scene, okay, well to get to the play scene, I actually have to start playing the level. And if I bring the console up here now, when I press the H key, it prints out hello world to the console. Okay. So, it's almost easier to do it this way once we have this architecture set up. So that's, that's pretty cool, I think. Now, let me blow your minds, okay? Hopefully I'm gonna blow your minds, um, or at least you'll say, oh, that's cool. Uh, what I have here is not assignment three. However, it's some research code that I'm writing for like my actual research that I do in game AI, okay? So for this game AI stuff, I have, uh, I'm actually using like an, an upgraded version of the assignment three engine. So I can like switch games while I'm playing it. So like I can be playing Mario and then in the same game, I can just switch scenes to another game. 
So I'm playing this and now I'm playing Mario. So the same game engine runs both games and I can switch between the games with just a keystroke. So um, let me just run this again to, to get back to... Uh, all right. So now what I can do inside... <laughs> Now that I have these actions, which are um, sort of done in this robust way, where it's just like a string, right, that I'm reading in, let me show you something cool that you can do. So I talked before about replays. I don't have replays running right now, but what I do have is an even more robust type of replay. And that replay, I have a ghosting system. So if you've ever played like Super Mario Kart or something like that, I have a ghost system built in for playing black back replay files. So in my research, what I've done is, and if you've done 3200, um, or if you're doing 3200 right now, you know about the A star search algorithm. Well, you can do A star search within this game engine. So it might not be, might not seem obvious how, but what I can do with my mouse here is I'm going to right click right here in the level and my search system in the background is going to figure out the optimal se sequence of actions to get Mega Man from the current position to up here. Okay, so I'm going to click and then I'm going to hold my hands up and you'll see that I'm not controlling Mega Man. See, that was the AI system in the background running an A star search to actually get from one position to another system. So that's the AI controlling this. Let me let me try and click over here so that the AI has to get on top of the pipe. Now I've got my settings tuned so that it may actually be a little bit too slow. These A star searches are like are quite long. So I may have to do that again. Let me just walk a little bit closer. This is research code after all. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to click here now. All right, let's see. let's see. So the search goes back around, jumps and then shoots. So it the AI did that, right? I I did not do that. Okay. So the way that this is implemented is that the AI search, remember how your AI system for assignment 2 creates a path, right? And then the user interface draws that path. Well, what this AI system does is it returns a replay in the form of an ordered sequence of actions that the player should perform. Now, there's no specific code in the scene to, that knows anything about AI. It doesn't know anything about replays or systems of actions. It's just that in the game engine, the game engine take like, I've got a, I've got a special AI engine going on in here, but it, it, generates that path as a sequence of actions and then just tells the game engine do these actions at these specific times okay now here's something even cooler in my opinion is that instead of actually taking control of my character in the game like it is right now what i can do is say show me how i would have gotten there if my character would have been controlled. So what this is going to do is it's going to run the AI search in the background in a thread, and then it's going to return the replay, and it's going to play that replay back as a ghost. So just watch. So my character is still down here, but I've told the AI to show me a ghost of what that would have looked like. How would I have gotten up there? So just think about if you want to like... If you need a hint in a platforming game, like how could I possibly get over there? So let's let's go to a little bit more of an interesting situation later on in the level. So let's say that I am currently down here, all right, but I want to get up to this block. And I'm a newer player, like this is, I don't know, my mom playing the game. Sorry, mom, if you're watching. But how would I get up to this part in the level? Well, I can right click, the search will run, and it will show me exactly how I would get up there. Okay, so let's do that again. And I can click a bunch of these places and it will run these searches in the background and it will show me how that I how I should have gotten there. So, and this is all done with the exact same system that we're using for assignment three with actions and replays. Okay, 
So um, let me delete all of these replays and I'll show you something else that's really cool. Actually, let me restart so I go back to the start of the level. Let's say that I wanted to know, um, let's say I wanna know where is it possible to get in this level and where might there be some areas that my player uh, players would die in the level, right? So over here, we see like there's a, there's a piranha plant going up and down. So let's move over to, I don't know, I, I just want to be able to see both piranha plants. Let's, let's say I'm in the, in the middle right here, okay? Um, actually, I want to do it over here first. So I'll go back over. Oh, I just died. I don't have a restart key right now. So let me do this again. So what I can do is instead of running an A star search, how about I just generate a random replay where uh, every quarter of a second, so I'm gonna generate a replay that's like a minute long and four times a second, it's going to do a random action. And let's say I want there to be 50 of those running around. Well, I can do that with one key press. Here you go. So this is a bunch of randomized replays being played back in this scene. So there's just random, random stuff going on, right? However, let me press this button a few more times. And if you can see down here, there's these little silhouettes. I've drawn those little silhouettes wherever the player has died in one of those random replays, okay? So I'm gonna generate a bunch of random replays. I'm gonna let it play out and I'm gonna see what it looks like after a little while. So let's generate some more, let's generate like a few hundred of these. And this is the same game engine from assignment three. You can see how fast this game engine is. It's actually kind of crazy. Let me generate some more guys. Okay. So what you can see now, let me let me let them die down a little bit. They're they're still a bit uh they're still a bit feisty. Alright, so now you can see this is a sort of heat map, right? You can see where the player has died, and it's centered entirely around that that area of the of the the flower that comes up and bites people right now of course these are just random replays but you could use this as a form of like game testing and that game testing would say something like oh look this area is probably where people are going to die at first let me go back and i want to show you one more example of that um, let me do it from here Right? You can see down here, all of these randomized players died to these Goombas walking around down, down here. And if I move over, let me delete all of those. And I'm going to go to the place with the hole. I'm going to kill this, this, uh, this, this pitcher plant, flower plant. Let me generate a bunch of replays here, or a bunch of randomized things here. And you can see... Okay, the, the usual suspect, this, this piranha plant over here is killing some people, but also this hole is killing some people, right? So this, this kind of thing, when you make your game engine just a little bit more robust, right? By putting in these sort of arbitrary actions and you spend maybe, I don't know, an hour implementing this change and you, you, make, some, you make the ability to play back replays you can get all sorts of insanely cool functionality in your game engine that would have been really, really difficult if all of your, if not impossible, right? If all of your actions were still tied to those actual physical pressings of buttons. I actually don't know how you would possibly implement this if it was still that case. So this is a really advanced sort of case, but, um, it just shows you, it's a little bit of motivation for why you might want to actually go ahead and, and care about something like this. Because when you're actually like making a game that you want to be good, you want it to have this sort of functionality that, that you could do. And if I go over here, another cool thing that you can do with this is, um, let's see, for example, like how hard might it be for you to get up here? Right? So if I generate a replay to get up there with A star, it's kind of like, that's a hard sequence of actions to go through to get up for a new player. So let's just say, for example, let me generate 500 random players 
And if out of 500 random players, nobody got up there, maybe it's a little bit hard, right? So you can see here, some people are getting up there. Some people are running around on the first level, but does anyone actually get up to the second level? You can see some people like coming over here, getting stuck. They're jumping around. Oh, one, one person, one person got up, but didn't, but didn't quite get, get through. They got up, but there's, they, they destroyed those bricks in their, in their world. Right? So you can see over here, oh, these bricks are destructible, by the way. Let me just, let me destroy all these. The reason they were able to get out here is because they can shoot the bricks. However, I'm not showing the destruction of the bricks in, in this example of the assignment. Um, so let's see, for example, how many people make it over here uh, from a random replay. Well, of course, the random ones, the vast majority of them are just going to die, right? They're jumping into this hole. Let's generate some more ones. Oh, one person got over there. A bunch of people are shooting it. That's not very uh, productive. So it's just something you can use. And But like the amount of time it would take you to get to this point with randomized players, I'm not talking about the really cool search algorithm stuff, but you could, I believe in you, once you finish assignment three in the way that I've given you, you could probably implement this within a couple of hours. And in fact, if you do do that, it's gonna be worth bonus marks on the assignment, okay? So you don't have to necessarily do this, but I will definitely give bonus points to anyone who goes this far um, in implementing it, okay? And that's basically all that I wanted to talk about in this lecture. We're done really, really quick. I just had to get that one lecture in uh, where I showed you uh, this, this action system that we're going to be using for assignment three. And now that you have this, you have all the tools that you need to do for assignment three. And if I go over to assignment three, um, in the next lecture, um, which is actually going to be given on Friday, I believe, um, I may do it on Thursday night or Friday. I'm not sure. Um, but it doesn't matter. It, it'll be there for you on Friday. Um, we'll go through assignment three and assignment three in this course is going to be the most work of any of the assignments. So of the four or five assignments in this course, assignment three is going to be the most work. Um, and the reason for that is because we have like more new stuff, but like the entity manager is done for you, right? You, you, you don't have to do anything super complicated, but there's just a lot of stuff to do. Okay. So, um, I have hints for you in what like order you should do the things. It, it won't be difficult, but it will be a lot. Okay. And that's going to be a lot of your programming career. Not everything is super difficult, but it will be a lot of work. So just make sure that, uh, that you start assignment three sooner rather than later. And like I said, that's all I have for today. So thank you for tuning in and I'll see you in the next one for assignment three.